In this video, you get to sit at the end of the table as you watch Eiler, Tom, and me pick apart the PTS in preparation for my CFI check ride. Sit back and relax while we provide you with a simple way of preparing yourself for your big day. Feel free to join the discussion by leaving your comments below. And as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel today. Let's get started. <laughs> We're going to say at this point, all the paperwork is done, mm -hmm. all the rights have been read to you, and the pilot bill of rights. Yeah, the pilot bill of rights and everything. And now your oral is going to begin as a flight instructor. And Eiler is going to act as a person explaining how and what the examiner is going to approach from the very first step starting now. paperwork and they tell you the outcome this you know fail pass or discontinue as you know mine was a discontinue because of weather so then you start on FOI and FOI tells you that the examiner shall get task E and one more task my DPE he, uh, he picked two tasks instead of one so we cover three in uh, FOI we cover task C which is the teaching process we went over everything there then we cover task E, which is the mandatory one. Okay, that, uh, can you give me an example real quick task? You said C? Yeah. Explain to me how you are going to explain to the examiner to where he knows you've said enough and it's time to move on. So okay. I just asked you, that if I was an examiner, I would say, can you explain task C sure. to me? Absolutely. And task C, the first step, the number one is preparation of a lesson. And uh, that's nothing else than how you prepare your lesson before you ever give it to the student. So there is certain things that you want to do when you're preparing that lesson. And uh, the lesson is you want to do objective performance based. So you want to have things to work towards, right? So if you're doing a slow flight, your object, what are your objectives for a slow flight? Well, you're trying to control the airplane at almost stalling speed, just a few knots above stalling speed, which you can barely have any input on your aileron and your rudder and you're trying to maintain altitude, maintain heading, and maintain uh, that airspeed, right? So that's your goal for that one lesson. So how do we achieve those goals? Well, first we start with, we don't do 55 knots right off the bat, we start at 60, 65 knots, right? And then you start working the student towards that. And so the ACS for private pilot says it's within 100 feet. Well, yeah, we're gonna work towards that, but then we're gonna do my minimums and it's not going to be 100 we're going to do it to commercial standard right if you can do commercial standard you're going to kill your private pilot so that's pretty much what that is then you got a skills condition and criteria so that is just nothing else other than how we're going to accomplish this objectives right so what do we have to do to put a check mark next to the objective and move on with our next lesson and that's what we just talked about. We're gonna get it within ACS standards and then we're gonna make them better than ACS standards. So that's all that is when you're preparing the lesson. Then you got organizational material and that goes into three sections. It goes into your introduction, the development and conclusions. So introduction is nothing else than explaining the lesson and the objectives for that lesson. Then development is how we're gonna get those objectives. So it explains the maneuvers, explains how we're gonna do them, what our minimum, what our standards are and what we're gonna do to make them better. And then the conclusion is nothing else than going over the lesson and make sure we did it good. So make sure that we got the objectives that we were planning to get. Then uh, we got training delivery methods. There is a few of them. So lecture method is the first one. That is just what I'm doing to you guys. You guys sit there and I talk and bore you guys to death. Uh, guided discussion method. That's when you ask a skillful questions to the student. So you don't tell the student what we're gonna talk about, but you ask them questions to get into what you want to talk about, right? Right. So let's say I want to talk about stalling speed. Well, we're going to talk about what happens when you come in low for landing and you start pulling back to keep your, your speed and then you forgot to add power. So you start asking questions to take him to the topic you want to talk about, right? Okay. So you guide him to that topic. He thinks he got there by himself, but you're really guiding him to that topic. 
with the questions that you're asking. Is that better for group settings too, like group ground school settings? So that would, it depends. There is a single one and there is a group setting as well. So it depends how you're doing. If there's a one-on-one -on -one or if there's just a classroom, then you just posting the questions to the okay. classroom. Nothing changes, just whether you have one person or more than okay. one person. Like if you're holding a ground school. Correct. Right, to so more than one person. One -on -one instructor. Well, it's not a lecture. It's more everyone's sure. participating. Right, so you get yeah. to the end of the lecture and you want to ask questions then, but you want to ask questions about a topic that you know most of your students are, or most private pilots are weak no. on, like weather. Oh, okay. Everybody sucks at weather, right? God knows I suck at weather. Because there's so much to learn that you don't really learn at all. So if you want to take it there, just start asking questions to, you know, yeah. push everybody Maybe towards you know. the weather, towards weather. Mm -hmm. uh, then you start, you have computer assisted learning method. I'm pretty sure everybody knows about this because ground school, like mm -hmm. I did all my ground school through King's It says school. King's school is on here. Yeah. yeah. So that's, it's just the computer assisting you. There's no yeah. interaction from a CFI. Right. It's just you on the computer. Uh, demonstration performance method. This is more when we get into flying already. So you show it to the student and then the student does it. There's, a, there's two types. And I like the one that you do it while you're explaining it. Then you get the student to explain it while you do it. And then the student explains it while he does it. Okay. So that way, it's in his mind, he's talking himself through the maneuver, right? Mm -hmm. So if I tell you when we're gonna do a slow flight, first thing you're gonna do is bring the power back, start setting flaps as you get into the flaps range, and you're setting it out loud. You're not gonna forget because you're literally saying it out loud. You're telling it to yourself, mm -hmm. which is what I found very helpful in commercial. I was talking myself through the maneuvers, so I didn't forget all the man anything on the maneuver. And then the drill and practice, just that's what it is. Drill and practice, like when we're talking about the eight flights, how we just go out there, we do turns, climbs. And uh, descent, that's just drill it. Over and, and, drill and over and, and, drill and, and over. Correct. Exercise. Yep. Uh, we got problem based learning. I like that. Uh, that's more like a real life kind of training. So you give the student problems as you're flying. So let's say we have a cross country and we're going to talk about emergencies. As we're flying the cross country, I can start giving you problems. I'm not actually, you know, making the problem happen, but I'm, I'm giving you scenarios. Like, hey, if our engine were to fail right now, where, where are we going to land? What are we going to do? And yeah. you're posing the problems to the students as they're flying yeah. to get their decision making going, right? Right. Okay. And then instruction aids and training techniques. That's I did that on the on my check right. I brought a bunch of stuff and like I told you, I put it on his Apple TV. Uh -huh. And I was I was visually explaining What'd it to him. What did you bring? I brought my iPad with the, the lesson plan. And then when we're talking about for, for example aerodynamics, I'll put out the aerodynamics section and we'll go through it. And he has images and stuff that I could explain to him instead of me just talking and not really making a lot of sense. Because the student, like he understands, he's being a DP. Do you still so have that on your iPad? So she's yeah, I gave her access to. Okay, yeah. so you get your eyes on it. Yeah. Because exactly. he understands, you guys understand when I talk to you about aerodynamics, but a PPL student might not understand. So an image it's all, it helps a lot. Okay. If I tell you the wings or the aileron, and I'm trying to show you what the aileron is, but I'm telling you it's what makes the airplane go, you know, right and left. Might not understand, but if I show it to him on a picture, hey, this is the aileron, this are the flaps, that will make it a lot easier, right? And that is the teaching process. Yeah. So uh, now you get task E, which is a, that one's the task mandatory, the mandatory one. one. Yep, that one you will cover no matter what. So how did he approach task so, E? With you? Instructor responsibilities and professionalism. It divides it in two. It divides it into ground instructor and flight instructor, but then it overlaps. So I just covered what didn't overlap. So helping a student learns. That's I mean that. It's kind of your job. The student, <laughs> the student has to learn, and it's not all on the instructor. Obviously, a student needs to want to learn. Mm -hmm. You cannot force a student to learn, right? You can do the best you can, but if they don't want to learn, they don't want to learn. Uh, make it enjoyable. So make sure that when you give them a difficult task, it brings reward. Yeah. So if the landings is probably the hardest part of aviation. If they have a good landing, praise them. And, and also like, end the lesson with a positive note. Right. Uh, at the same time, sometimes you gotta pull their ears. So I probably pull their ears before you praise them. So that way you end with the praising. Yeah. But I mean, if you did something wrong, you did something wrong. Um, and make clear objectives. Those are the main three things. So you know, done. Make it clear for them what they're working towards, right? So if we're gonna go out and do eight lessons of turns, climbs, and descents, explain to them why we're doing this. You need to know how to turn, climb, descend before we can do anything in aviation really, right? Yeah. You need to understand why the plane does what it does, when it be, how it behaves, the way it behaves, when it climbs and turns. So those three are the main things on helping students learn, then providing adequate instructions. 
Uh, so we want to tailor the teaching technique to the student. Just because you have 12 students don't mean all 12 of them are the same, right? Mm -hmm. One might be more visual than the other one, one will be more hands-on than the other one. So you want to tailor your instructions to that one student, right? So change your change your uh, lesson plan accordingly to that approach. one student, correct. Yeah. So that's the main thing. And then be prepared to change the way you're instructing. If the, if the way you're doing it is not getting to the student, then try something, try something different. else. See right. if you get to the student. Everybody right? learns different. I learned that a long time ago. Right. And we all have different personalities. So yeah. the way exactly. we see things is a lot different. And uh, a standards of performance. So, and this is what we we're talking about earlier, train to PTS, ACS standards, right? Because at the end of the day, they have to pass the check, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not a training document. Don't just cover what's going to be on the check, right? They need to know, obviously, more than that. Yes. And not only leave it to PTS or ACS standard, make it better. Mm -hmm. Like, I hate Tom when I'm flying with him because he's a pain in my butt, but... Because he expects perfection. Correct. He doesn't yeah. train you to PTS, ACS standards. He trains you to his standards, which is a pain in my butt. Yeah. So... <laughs> He nitpicks on the little things. But that makes your check right easier. It makes it makes your life a whole lot easier. Uh, so don't train to PTS ACS standards, train to better standards. Mm -hmm. If they can pass, I call it my standards. If you can pass my standards, you can beat the PTS ACS, no issues. All right, so that covers ground instructors. So now flight instructor responsibilities, and we're going right back to the same things. So motivate the student, try to keep them as motivated as you can. And I look, I like Kevin for that. When we did some of our cross countries, I brought my wife and we'll stop and go to an airport that had something to eat. We'll stop, eat something and then come back. And he wouldn't charge me for that time we're eating, but it was nice because I wasn't just flying and doing lessons and you know, getting tired. Yeah. We're actually going to eat, spending time. It's a, so if you want to bring a family member or something, as long as they understand the risk and how everything is, I mean, there's nothing yeah. that says they cannot. You're, you're as long as we're not there. practicing stalls and Correct. Stuff. As long as it's just a cross country, we're not going to make right. a guy in the back puke and you're not exceeding the, you know, the, um, the limits of the airplane because you have too many passengers. Right. So that kind of thing. But, you know, try to make them enjoy it. Uh, keep them informed. So mostly of their progress. Like, hey, you did good today, but we still need a few more lessons on uh, probably a couple more lessons on a slow flight. You're still having issues maintaining altitude or maintaining heading. Or you're so, right where you need to be. You, you always use that. Right. Or, right where you need to be. Whatever. We'll move on. <laughs> uh, approach them as individuals. And we talked about that when you're doing your lesson plans and everything. That, I mean, yeah, we did it's not that. Mm -hmm. the same. I told you it overlaps a lot. That's why I told it was dumb. Uh, give credit when due. Again, we talked about that. Praise them. Uh, criticize constructively. Um, you know, don't tell them you're an idiot. I mean, yeah. even if, you, if you're an idiot, probably you're an idiot. It's not the right thing to say something. Uh, be consistent and uh, just you know, if you're asking for this standards today, tomorrow don't ask for something that's three times harder. You know, make it harder, but be consistent yeah. the way you ask for things. Don't yeah. just change it from one day to the next. And admit when you're wrong. That's a big one. Yeah. If you so, if you don't know, it's better you say you don't know than say something that is wrong. And then when they, if they ever find out that you were wrong, they tell you like, nah, I, I didn't say that, or nah, I wasn't wrong. If you're yeah. wrong, you're wrong. We're all humans. I'm learning. So if I don't know the answer, I know how to look it up. Just, yeah. I might not be able to get back to you today, yeah. but tomorrow I'll, I'll get back to you. And as you as you teach. This is where you're going to learn so much because you're going to have so many questions and you realize that you don't know the answer. You go, I'll answer that question next weekend. <laughs> I think that's <laughs> from, from <laughs> <this club. laughs> yeah. Yeah. Next week when we have breakfast again. Yeah. Uh, but then you go look it up and then the next time a right. student asks you. Not only that, you, you don't just look that up. Then you find other stuff. Because exactly. how many times have I sit down to read, the, I'm looking for something on the far aim and next thing you know I'm like, wait, I can do that? Because I found something else that I had no idea. It was and then after there. years of instructing, somebody's going to add the questions are pretty much always the same. Then somebody's going <laughs> to ask you something. You go, yes, let me explain that to you because you already looked it up before. <laughs> like this is like the seventh time that I answered yeah, it. Right. So I'm like, I got you. <laughs> Those are your main flight instructor responsibilities. And then you have uh, physiological obstacles for flight students, and that's just you know the main one that I found when I was reading. It was students getting sick. And that happens a lot because we're in Florida. At Five p.m. is bumpy day. It's bumpy uh, yeah. festival, so it happens with my daughter once. Right. Like it's impossible to maintain day. altitude and maintain heading because you're getting bumped around like nobody's business. Yeah. So you have to be correcting every two seconds. And remember when I told you you're doing your private, and I was like, I know you think I'm doing this, but I'm watching everything you're doing out of here, and I can tell when it's time to take a break because yeah. you know towards the check ride we were doing Hell Week, and she was like. Take it off. 
Then towards 11 a.m. Yeah, you tell her something and it takes like two yeah, seconds. I start like, saying, all right, trust me this. <laughs> she's, she's not even motivated. And her peripheral view was just this. <sighs> <laughs> I went, went out, one I went with Kevin with one, and, uh, went out with one of the students. So we're doing that, just turns, climbs on descent, and he was getting it actually very. He was getting it very well. And then probably an hour and a half into it, I tell him, "Okay, what do you do when you're climbing?" And you can tell like the hamster is trying to move, but the brain is not. Oh yeah, it's. I'm like, I <laughs> we turn. It's like the cell we go. Or if it's close to check ride, like I said, it's lunchtime. I know when she needs that. Right. Because because at that, that point, you're the at that product. point they're stealing the money because they're not really grinding. Right. Exactly. So. Yeah. Um, but you also have to train them to put, uh, towards the rating when they're tired to push through it sometimes. Right. Because, because what if you have it on your check ride? Exactly. If you're doing your CFI oral. Then you got to launch, and then you get that uh, launch, <laughs> I'm tired, and then you got to go do a flight. You got to teach them, yeah. push them to, to power through. I was just power actually through. happy I didn't eat lunch because you know lunch makes you dumb. Yeah, you want to go to sleep. Exactly. So I was actually ha I was still energized. Yeah. Energized. I was like, I thought it would be better just bringing like a kind bar or something. Yeah, just have like an energy before. bar or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't need a yeah. big Not heavy a full lunch. lunch. Yeah. And, yeah. and if you feel after the oral you're wiped, discontinue. Discontinue. Yeah. Yeah, Nothing says you're gonna because that's the same. I, I was long he told day. Me that. You can discontinue for any reason you would want, so yeah. discontinue. So and then six years. So if your student starts getting sick, I did my uh, my discovery flight was in a popka in an ultralight at two p.m. on a summer day. <laughs> I almost puked. Yeah. I didn't think aviation was my thing. And then I did my second <laughs> flight. I did on Kissimmee at seven a.m. Yeah. And it was like, wait a second, I can do this. So you know, if you have a student that's getting sick, then just schedule early or schedule late. So that's uh, that's the, the biggest one. The other ones are if the student is scared, like you can try to help them, you know, like little by little. If they're scared of a certain maneuver, you can start doing the maneuver slowly. Like if there's steep turns, well, we'll start with doing standard rate turns, then we'll kick it up to like 30, for, and eventually we'll get to what you need to do. But you know, yeah. little by little, try to help them the most you can. Uh, and then ensuring a student's ability. This has mostly to do with uh, before they go solo, you wanna make sure that they're ready. Yeah. Um, going solo is not just a one-way decision, it's a two-way decision. The student might feel he's ready and you're like, mm, I don't yeah. think so. Yeah. Or you might feel that they're ready and they're like, mentally, they're like, mm, no. So you cannot push them either to it. Yeah. So once both parties agree that they're ready, then we'll, uh, you can do that. So, you know, just ensure that they can do the basic maneuvers like we're talking about, stalls, slow flight, go around. Those so are all that. the ground reference maneuvers, Correct. Right? Uh, so that's that. Student, so professionalism. We talked about this earlier. There's a big list, but it's mostly you know common stuff. Don't mm -hmm. don't do some, don't do to people what you wouldn't people would doing to you kind of thing. Yeah. So treat everybody with respect, and that should be fine. And try to keep the jokes maybe to a minimum. Exactly. I mean, keep it lighthearted, but keep the jokes to a minimum so that way they know you're serious about instructing. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Then instructors, aviation and aviation instructors and exams. So just the written test, you gotta make sure, you know, if you're gonna endorse them, you gotta make sure that they're ready. Uh, I like King, I like ground schools online. I think they're a lot better because all the knowledge is right there at your hands. You know, you do it at your own pace. But if somebody wants to do ground school with their instructor, they can. It's just gonna be expensive because it's a lot of hours. And uh, professional development is just, you became a CFI and you're like, all right, peace, I'm done. That's it, that's all I need to do. Oh, well, now you wanna make yourself better, right? For you and your own students as well. So you know, make yourself better. Don't just, not just stop. Just get, get certificates. Get make yourself the best instructor you can for your students, and that covers task E. You okay. have any question? So anyway, you're starting to see where this is going. Yeah, it's going to do. So, we don't now need to that do. we're going through it, it really doesn't seem as no. And I like the way he does. He looks down. Evaluation of student ability, and then he looks up. He already knows. You can talk about this free style. You know, you can see, but if I didn't, re so on evaluation of a student's ability, the only thing I, that what I wrote was demonstrated ability, keep them informed. Yeah. That's and the two things I wrote. Then I can just expand on that. Yes. And yes. Think, picture, visualize yourself. And that's what you want to read and you want to write good. it down yourself. Because yes. it keeps, it stays on your head. Now, what you want to talk when about. When you study, you study every single task because you didn't know which one. Right. I knew which ones he was going to do because the mandatory ones. But then I didn't know what else well, was going to be. There's one mandatory. There is one mandatory. He picked, and we did three. Yes. So he picked. He so you're going to have to learn A through So he has That's one, two, three, four, five, bad. six, seven, eight, or seven to pick. And only one is mandatory. So there's six more that he can pick. Right? And you walked in there 100% comfortable with all with eight. With all six. Of those. So, so that way, yep. you know, 
And at the he end, can pick whatever he wanted. When he said C, I was like, all right, cool, C it is. And then when, after you did those three, you were done with FOI. FOI is done. So that was it? Well, now then there's risk management. It's the last section of it. Yep. There's only six of them. Uh, well, no, there's a couple more in the back, but it's this is all checklist right here. Most of it is just our checklist. I'm safe, uh, paid checklist, five piece. It, th three of them are just checklists that you explain what the checklists are and what they do. After the FOI version, then... <coughs> So he then just we go to area two and we cover task B, which is runway incursions avoidance. Where, where is that at? Right here. Uh, now we're, well, we're in the part that you were earlier. I didn't write anything on that one because when you read them, they're self explanatory. Did you just read this verbatim? So there is, a, and this is the one that I, he, was, he was very cool about it because I was like, listen, this is, I'm not there's, going through 17, 17 items, things. right. So most of it is the same. So I'm just going to summarize all this. It's like, hey, if I have any questions at the end, I'll let you know. I'm like, all right. And so, so how did you do that? So distant challenges and requirements during taxi operations. I just talked about, you know, unfamiliar airports, uh, aircraft moving around, how you need to keep an, a year out on ATC, make sure that they're not sending somebody the same way that you're going and they're going to hit you. If you see somebody else coming, stop, that kind of thing. Uh, then procedures for appropriate cockpit activities during taxing. There is nothing done here during taxing other than taxing, right? We're going we're gonna to look at the diagram. We're going to decide which way we're going to go and we're going to taxi. There's no looking around. There, I mean, there's no looking down. There's no looking at your phone. If you need, if you get lost, stop. Look down. Yeah. Get, and also, you need you to are. have a plan B because even the other day when I had Monica, we planned on a nine left departure. Well, so I don't. And then I they never flipped the airport. I never recommend that. So, and it, they cover it here. That's how, expecting something and not getting it. And Kevin almost did that with me. When he only, we so remember the airport. I don't know if it's still the construction. I haven't flown in like a week. Uh, and they are, if you go to the 227 center, you have to go around and right. go Kilo, Bravo, or Romeo, Romeo yeah. instead of just Charlie Romeo, which yeah. is where we normally go, right. right? So they give us our stop. I read back Kilo, Bravo, Romeo, but Kevin is the one taxing. And he starts making the right turn to go into Charlie. I'm like, what the hell are you going? He's like, to the wrong way. I'm like, don't you see the freaking construction? Like, yeah. you need to go left. In his head, he's so used to Charlie Romeo that he was going Charlie Romeo, even though we didn't yeah, get Charlie really. Romeo. Yeah. So uh, that's why. Even at that well, that's why it's good to know that you're, yeah, you're so you, you know the airport so much that right. you, you know exactly where you're going, but something might have changed on one day, and now you must stop. Right. But you'll even talk yourself into it, like, how am I going to get around all that construction? But I'm still heading for it. Right, right, right. I, I can see the freaking truck, but I'm, I'm going that way. I don't know how I'm getting yeah. out of there. So yeah, don't don't have a plan in your head. Just wait for them to tell you. You look down, and you're like, all right, this is the way we're going, because. Again, what if that doesn't happen? Mm -hmm. And they talk about it here, having a, 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 getting something other than expected. So just because you're expecting something doesn't mean it might happen, right? That is true. How many times have I gotten a full reroute? Like I filed an IFR and a fourth flight said, that's your expected route. And so that's when I programmed into a GPS already. And next thing they're like, oh yeah, you clear to the, and I'm not ready to write because I'm expecting my route as filed. Uh -huh. And they're like, yeah, you clear to the VA. And you, I'm like, uh, well, I'm, I'm yeah. gonna need that one more time, bro. <laughs> you caught me off guard, everybody. So, because I expected something else. That's why I happen. always, even here at Sanford, write down the yep. taxi instructions, and, I, I, and then I just yep. I can verify it with the taxi driver. That's, that's, that's not. And they talk about right it here. Down. Just write it down. Uh, yeah, exactly. Relevance of importance of whole of whole shorelines. I mean, you can talk talk about that. Uh, texting while <laughs> while talking to your passengers while taxing. Uh, holding pilots workload to a minimum during taxi operations so you know just taxi and again that's the same thing that we just talked earlier just taxi don't do anything else don't be doing running checklists and stuff while you're trying to taxi like don't be putting mixture to full and turning lights on as you even haven't gotten to the runway yet right so right. short of the again, runway and do it short of the runway I like what the way he's approaching this he'll glance and go uh, relevance importance and hold short lines and then he'll tell a story about it right and then you glance and then you tell story. Yeah, you make it relatable, you're not gonna forget it. Right. Right. And experience that you've had. Tell them. Yeah. I mean there, there is no wrong word. Right. right. It's not yeah. like a tomato or flames. This is <clears throat> right. This is just explaining it. Yeah. So you don't explain it like somebody else would. That makes no sense. Explain it as you would. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're the one explaining it. Uh, procedures for maintaining enhancing or maintaining enhancing situational awareness when conducting taxi operations in relation to other aircraft. I already covered that at the beginning when we talked about you gotta be listening to ATC. Make sure they don't send somebody the wrong way in Charlie as you're going towards two seven right, right? So if you hear that, stop and be like, "Hey, you do know I'm here, right? Like, it's what are we doing?" Um, 
If they don't like that you're questioning them, oops. Yeah, sorry. My yeah. safety comes first. I'm not worried about hurting yeah. someone's if, feelings. Uh, exactly. My safety comes event, first. Uh, yesterday. I so learned that trust, you ever have but verify. Trust <laughs> <is fair. laughs> and remember, as a private pilot, you are. Where you're like, I don't want to get in trouble. Yeah, you're, yeah. The, you're the danger <laughs> here. <laughs> I don't care how they <laughs> yep. how exactly. they are. You know? So, and that, I mean, procedures for briefing if a landing rollout to a taxiway exit will place the pilot in close proximity to another runway. And that's something that you should do in the air. As you're looking at the diagram, maybe we're gonna, probably gonna land this runway. Like here, you land nine left, you got nine or center right there. Yeah. And as you roll out, you don't wanna go into nine or center. If you roll out of Romeo, just make sure you under, you know, you got a whole short of Charlie. Um, Appropriate after landing taxi procedures in the event of aircraft on a taxiway that is between parallel runways, that's the same thing. Uh, specific procedures for operation on an airport with an operating air traffic control tower with emphasis on ATC communications, runway entry crossing authorization. So I'll read back everything. And if you don't remember, if you were clear to cross, ask. Stop and ask. Yeah. How many times have I forgotten? Like, oh, crap. Oh, how many times they cleared yeah. me to land like five miles out? And yeah. I'm on a one mile final. I'm like, oh. Was that clear? They cleared me to land. Because <laughs> you're getting cleared to land so often, you can't. Hey, it's just six minutes to clear to land. Because the next time. Because so. I can remember it. Right, I can remember it now. So yeah. even if you don't remember, go around. Just don't land if you don't remember. ATC communications on a, a pilot's actions before takeoff, before landing, and after landing at a tower and non-tower airport. That's just you know, ATC. If they tell you to do something and you're still on the runway trying to come to a stop, just ignore them. We'll get back to them once we land. Yeah. Our priority is control of the airplane, not talking to ATC. Right. So once we land and hold shore, we'll get back to ATC. If we are if we are able to answer, we're on the wrong way. Fine. If not, fly the airplane first. How many times I've told something and I look and I'm like, what did he say? Because I, I was that I was I was concentrating on something else. So that's that goes back to fly the airplane first. Fly the airplane first. Correct. Yeah. It's ATC. They can wait. Communication comes all the way at the end. Procedures unique to night operations. So, you know, everything looks different at night. The first time you taxi at night, even in San for a first taxi at a time, a taxi, I'm like, whoa, whoa what the hell? Where yeah, am I? It does. Where's spot five, man? <laughs> like, I couldn't, it looks all different, right? And not only that, it's harder to see things too, so. Operations at non tower airports, you know, just announce that if, you, if you're taxiing, you see somebody taxiing as well, just announce your intention. If not, you're fine. Technically, you don't have to talk in the, in the control airport, but. But so it's, it's a good, good right? It's courtesy. a good manners and courtesy to do it. Yeah. Use of aircraft ex exterior lighting. My main thing is don't use your uh, don't use your strobes at nighttime. So you blind everybody else around you okay, that yeah. already had night vision, and you are now you blind everybody. And low visibility operations, most mostly just to slow it down while you're taxing on low visibility operations. Now that there should be a reason why you should be taxing on low visibility operations on a Cessna. Yeah. I mean, we're probably not gonna fly it away. So. Exactly. <laughs> so, but that's uh, and that is that is the seventeen things right there. Just summarize. So, just to recap, you went through FOI thirty minutes. You did three things, and then you took over when you said, "Do you have any questions?" Okay, let's move on into runway yep. versions. He already had told me what we we're covering, so okay. we just moved on to the next. Yep, okay. mm -hmm. that's right. And then task D. That's. Uh, <laughs> That's the, that's the one that... Uh, Task D? Yeah, D, that's Delta. Delta? Yep. I think, that was, yeah, that was the next. The next, which is principles of flight, and this is what we talked about earlier, when we talked about wind types and stuff. Here's where you're gonna cover them. Uh, airfoil design characteristics. He yeah. is gonna take you straight into uh, airfoil uh, designs. That's all he likes. Okay. And you're gonna talk about the different designs, what's good about them, what's bad about them. Like the rectangular wings, we use them on training aircrafts because they install the roof first. So yeah. you still have, uh, on the, at the end of the wings, you still have aileron control. And it gives you a good uh, good indication that it's stalling. Yeah. So you can recover, it's not just a stall. The elliptical ones, they produce lift across the entire wing, so the entire wing stalls at the same time. So that's not a good thing, because there's zero to no... Uh, then why would somebody have those? Well, it's they don't use them anymore. They're back in like World War II on the Mustangs. The Mustangs have them. Um, they're yeah, good for they're speed. Fly. Yeah, they're, they're good for speed. Stall. Like, they're better than... Uh, rectangular ones for speed, but they stall like crap. Yeah. The the entire wing stalls, so that means your entire aircraft stalling. You know, Cadillac. Where do I stuff. find the uh, different wing types and stuff? Uh, there is. I'll send you a few YouTube videos. There is a couple that I found. Yeah, you know, right on there. YouTube. Oh. YouTube. Yeah, I'll send you a couple videos. I'll yeah, have to go through my history and find them. He is very big on the sweat back ones, right. and he, he wants yeah. you to explain the critical, what is critical mark. You know, when the wing reach, the air is going moving so fast that. It just, it just 
goes over the wing so fast that it has to slow down on the other side. Because remember, the one going on top wants to catch up to the yeah. one on the bottom. Right. Now this one's going so freaking fast, yeah. and now it has to slow down to get, to wait for this one. Yeah. So but all this slowing puzzle. down is creating nothing but drag. It creates a shock wave, which is all over drag. So you don't want drag when you're doing like 500 knots over ground. Right. So the sweat bag allows the air to believe that it's going slower than what it actually is, hence delaying that critical Mach number, delaying the shock wave. Right. So it gives but you, you more speed. But it doesn't pr produce as much lift. At low speeds. Yeah. After it, that's it, why you got to add fat. That's why you do flaps. That's why you do a slab. Slab. That's what every lifting device that you can yeah. to get that airplane off the ground. Yeah. Once it's up and it's, it got speed, it's good. Yeah. It's just, it sucks. I and actually did read a little bit about that. And you don't want to stall. It stalls at the wing tip first, so you're going to die. There's no rec much for recovery. Yeah. But again, most of the last time you stall an airliner. I'm going to show you a video of that on air disasters. Somebody stalled it? West. Yeah, northwest. Yeah, there's no recovering from that bad. But yeah, they, they say you lose like thousands of feet to be able to there's recover. No, it's like throwing a rock down the runway. It's not gonna fly. So they got distracted, and it was a family in front of our family, the FO. Um, anyway, they I kept having a takeoff configuration warning horn. It was erroneous. So they would normally just pull the circuit breaker. So, but then going to Phoenix out of Detroit, they had weather. They were trying to rush, get the plane out. Uh, got into an argument with a controller, no. got lost in the taxi, and when they took off, they forgot to do the whole taxi checklist, which was slats extend. Well, and they had already pulled the circuit breaker. <coughs> so they didn't give him the So they only got 50 feet up, and it was just like, it was just the only person that lived was a four-year-old girl, and it was full on So it yeah. just fell off the ground, it fell off the sky? Yeah, I'm gonna show you the video so you can yeah. learn yeah. this stuff. Yeah, there is no uh, recovering from it, so, but again, normally you don't stall an airliner, so. Those are the main three, and those are the three I covered. And I went on my iPad, uh, so this is where I started getting a little visual with them. Yeah. So these are your types of wings. So I just, oh, there there's go. your elliptical, there's your rectangular, which the PA-28 has rectangular yeah. ones, most training aircraft do. Then high taper and moderate taper is just almost the same, so I didn't cover them. He didn't, he didn't care. And then the sweat back wings, I covered them as well. And so what you did was you took those and you just explained each one, mm -hmm. and then you were done with that. Yep. Well, with yeah. that one, yeah. And then we talked about airplane stability and controllability. So we talked about the hedral, anahedral, what it does to the wing, and why it does what it does. So, you know, how the, if you look at the airplane, the wings are not really straight. They're going to go up, uh -huh. uh, at least on the PA. That's a hedral that makes the airplane more stable. I'm sorry, that's the hedral. Yes, and that makes the airplane more stable. But if you look at the C-17 with the wing, the wings are like they're yeah. pulling down. That makes it less controllable. So we talked about static. Um, positive static. Yes, stability. positive and static and, uh, we and negative. And we talked about what type of planes will have what and why you want to have that. So like all the trainers have positive, the static and dynamic stability. And then neutral, we're looking at like air show airplanes, you know, like uh, acrobatic airplanes. You don't want the airplane to try to get better or get worse. You just want it to stay where it's at, right? Mm -hmm. And then negative, we're talking about like fighters because they're flown by computer. So the computer helps the airplane stay stable. But you want it to, if like if you die, you don't want to try to come back. You want it to keep dying, right? Turning tendencies, we talked about all of them. And he didn't really go very deep into them. I just explained what it was. And uh, Once again, did you just bring it up? Oh, yeah, yeah, I was the one. Okay. The, I, I, I move that check right along. Okay. At my speed. If he had this any questions, you to do. Yeah, if yeah. you had any questions, he will ask. But it was my speed. I finished. I asked him, "You have any questions on that?" No. Move on. So I didn't wait for him to say, "Okay, let's talk about something else." I, I, I took my check right. It was my check right, so I moved that check right along as I wanted it to go. Uh, low factors. We talked about that, and we talked about accelerated stalls. That was how I explained low factor to him. Like you know, you normally stall at 65 knots with no flaps. But you put it on a 45 degree bank, you start pulling back at 80 knots, you're going down. Why? Well, load factor. Now the wings, you loaded the wings a different way. So that's how I explain load factor. And load factor is kind of hard to explain. It's well, easier to show what you're flying. So that's why we're talking John, about it. He, he does a great yep. explanation that I have for you to watch of load factor. Uh, okay. Wing tip vortices and precautions to be taken. So this is Sanford. We do it all the time. Mm -hmm. Land past their point and uh, take off before the point, right. pretty much. Stay mm -hmm. above their, their uh, path, don't get below it because they that's fall. And some other things you can think about is the wind. If you're on 27 center, you're not even behind one. But if there's an Airbus landing, yeah, there's the a wind, crosswind. The crosswind's mm -hmm. going to blow over to your runway. Oh, yeah. 
So there is an example, and I brought it up. Uh, there is an example that happened a couple months ago. Uh, a P, I think it was a PA28 over the, under the JFK, under uh, the Kennedy uh, class, not under, he was through the Bravo, below an A380, uh, Air France A380, the weight turbulence started falling. He was given a weight turbulence advisory and everything. I mean, he never thought it was gonna happen. The airplane started shaking so bad because of the weight turbulence, the battery caught on fire. They had to do an emergency landing at JFK. Wow. The A380's uh, weight turbulence destroyed the little airplane. Wow. Thank God he was literally right next to JFK. She just joined the downwind and landed. That's task D. And then we did M. Uh, M. Logbook entries and certificates. So that's what we talked about the required logbook entries for instruction M given. As in M as a mic. Yep. And here I didn't really, we didn't go over over this. He just gave me the two examples I gave you earlier about a student pilot from a student pilot all the way to PPL. And then a, uh, a multi-engine commercial pilot that wants to add a single engine add-on. Okay. We talked about that. And then we talked about how long you're required to keep your instructor records for and your TSA records. So TSA is for five years, the other one are for three. So I just told him to be safe. If one is five, I'm just gonna keep them all for five. That's Did it. you explain to him how he can get, so you have a new student, how do you approach him? How do you get him other than the club? Because the club takes care of all that background and everything, you know, with. with uh, we, no, we talk, so we talked about the TSA uh, certificate, mm -hmm. you know, getting their citizen, verifying their citizenship, and that's all he, uh, he cared about. So, as you having a new student, so she's a new student, how are you going to get that from her? Get her what? Verifying her oh, citizenship. Oh, uh, passport. Okay. Uh, birth certificate. Right. Yeah. And then what do you no, mean? I'm sorry. He did, he did ask. He did ask that. How would you verify citizenship? And that's why when you look when we join the club, we get pictures of our passport, yeah. driver's license, and everything. Mm -hmm. Charles put it on file. It's a little more difficult if somebody's from out of the country. Right. There's a lot more steps involved, but it doesn't happen as often. I, 141 is cool, too, but. They take care of that. Do so you have to do any paperwork or do you just, can you just keep a passport and driver's license in your personal files and call it done? No, you have to do their endorsement, their TSA endorsement. Okay, on the road that. That's good. And keep, uh, keep the records for five years, so. Just yeah. saying. I said, I'll just keep all records for five years. Yeah. Just saying that you have viewed the passport, driver's right. license. And you, right. It doesn't say that you yeah. verify the real, because I mean, there's no way we can do, but it's to cover your body. If something does happen, I'm like, no, I have pictures of all, the, I have Well, the legal documents going to have a legal document stamp on it, right? Oh, I mean, I'm sure they're fake documents. The thing there. is, what there's what nothing you can do about it. Do you exactly. Not? What I'm getting at is. But you should be able to have some knowledge. You're going to need to tell what that TSA sign off is because you're not going to be lucky enough to have it. It's not in there. But the good thing is all you have to do is go back to your logbook. You'll be there. <laughs> every every body has to have it. So. But I mean, you, you have to know what to write. Right. Yeah. And, and uh, I'd for, say, for new students or foreign students? No. For even new. You got okay. For new, yeah, you got to do it for everybody. Possibly so TSA year. endorsement. Yeah, that's the first endorsement. So they get one freebie. Which is the is, first uh, endorsement they get. That's the, gonna be number one. Before you do any instructions, other than discovery flight, discovery flight, you don't need a TSA endorsement. Yeah. So you went from FOI to area two. Yeah, FOI is area one. Yep, area then you two. have area three. Area three. Area one, two, and three. So from here, he has to pick one. There is no mandatory one. It's just whatever so he wants. You just have to, to know it all. Now, seems like there's some sort of a trend that he likes E. Which is automated flame, where automated flames comes into play. Yeah, yeah that's fine. So, I was going through this in my head the other just day. Just make sure that you know the rest. I mean, there are like certificates and documents, and weather information, operation systems, performance and limitations, manual and. Uh, so he only asked you that one question: a tomato flame. No, 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 no. Okay. You go through the E to task E, but a tomato flames is part of task E. Airworthiness requirements. Okay. And then after you were done with all of that, oh, I see it was just E, just E. Then what? Uh, then we went to area four. I don't know if I have area four. Area four is pre-flight lessons on a maneuver to be performing flight. This is where you explain your aids on. Now, no. this is where we didn't do that. This is where we went back and we did emergencies. Area one, area two, 
Oh, oh, but it could have been eights on pylons or whatever. It could have been, it's a maneuver or emergencies. Yeah. So he picked emergencies for me, and then we went back and we picked five emergencies out of those 13. Or I picked so five. area four, you need to know how to explain a certain maneuver or a certain checklist emergency. Or a certain emergency. Back. Is yeah. area four the last area? Is it, that's, yeah. That's what I thought. So, but here's what he says, and this is why he gets so much freedom to pick whatever he wants. Examiner must select at least one maneuver task from areas of operation 7 through 13. So literally, he has half the book to find something to make you do. Okay. And then, and ask the applicant to present a pre-flight lesson on the selected maneuver as the lesson will be taught to a student. So he can go maneuver, he can go... And that's in the PTS? Yes, uh, so it's 7 through 13, so... 7 through 13. Yeah. So task, this is six, so seven, where is seven at? Where am I seven at? Seven, so take off landings and go arounds. Uh, task, then we get, okay, task eight, fundamentals of flight. So straight on level flight, level turns, straight climbs. He can ask you to explain anything he wants pretty much. Okay. So he, gets, okay. so he said, what maneuver would you like to explain? And I said, I don't care. Do you tell me which one you want me to explain to you? And he said, okay, I actually let's do something different. I want you to explain the emergencies. Okay. And we went back to the emergency. So he didn't give he didn't come out and say, Okay, explain one of these two to me. He just said, What do you want to explain? And I was like, I, I So I, what did you refer to? Care. Yeah. So let's go through that. Explain emergencies as you did yep. with your PTS. I can't remember which ones I picked, but I probably can't remember because I picked the easiest ones. <laughs> right. Uh, so a smoke, fire, or both during ground or flight operations. So if you start turning the engine on and start catching fire, let the engine run for a second. See if that engine pulls that fire inside the engine to contain it in there. If not, cut the mixture, turn it off, and get out of there. Right? Yeah. And if you have extinguisher somewhere, then you know use it. If freeze on the ground, try to bring the power back to get see that again that fire gets sucked into the engine. Open the windows, make sure you get rid of that smoke inside the cabin because you don't want to die of smoke inhalation there. An emergency landing. I mean, you have to land. So that's literally how I explained the first one. And yeah. it's pretty quick, isn't it? Easy. I, that's why I picked the easiest one to just go over them quick. Because I mean, what else am I going to explain there? That's yeah. literally what you do. Yeah. There is no time for checklists. There is no time for nothing. If you have a fire, you got to either extinguish it or land. Because yeah. there's a smoke inside the cabin. So I mean, you there is no much to do at that point. Uh, loss of engine oil pressure. So I got this one, and I got the, and I did the engine overheat together. Because it's kind of the same, one leads to the next. So if you have a low pressure, you know your engine, your heat, hot engine is coming like quick. Because nothing is cooling that engine enough now. Right. Only the air. So um, I told him, I'm like, hey, bring the power to back a little bit. Get take as much stress as you can out of that engine, so it doesn't have to work as hard. Mm -hmm. And then start descending quick, like quick to get some of that air in that engine and get it to cool off. Mm -hmm. and Imagine and your mixture. And you gotta uh, oh. Don't you well, enrich in your, enrich in your mixture? Yeah. Right. Get, uh, get the off. fuel in there. Yep. And do an emergency landing if yeah. you have to, because that engine is about to quit on you any time. So yeah. get get as much of that power as you can. And that, you land. definitely declare an emergency with that. Yeah. If you have time, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, fuel starvation. We cannot treat it as fuel starvation because you don't know what it is. So you have to treat it as some sort of malfunction with the fuel. So do our flow, if you're in a Cessna, it just feels starvation, because I mean, there's no reading. Really and once again, you're glancing down at the PTS. Yeah, I just, just look at it and each I one of it. I then look it up and explaining how to handle yeah. it. Okay. And then look down, and how many checklist items did you cover? Five? Yeah, it tells you right here, it's uh, at least five. He at only has to cover five. five. Okay, so write that down. For checklist, Yep, and this is area 13, emergency operations. Yeah, area 13. At least yep. five. Explain at least five. Um, so once again, you're gonna have to know all of them because you're gonna have to explain. Yeah. Well, I I mean, it all depends on whether he allows you to pick them or he tells you explain right. this five to me and he gives them to you. Exactly. So, so I was I was very lucky and he let, he was like just give me five and I was like, huh, oh, okay. Let me see what's easier here to explain. So I explained in the easiest ones and he was fine with it. Okay. And that okay. that was the end of it. Okay. That was my oral. And let me go back here. That was literally. Then we did just the flight. Um, the so flight what well, we're gonna do on the flight. Yeah. Bit. Basically, you're just gonna have to know all of these. You don't know what he's gonna pick. Mm -hmm. And then just be able to look and go, hey, well, if he picks this, tech cert certificates and documents, you can start off with, well, recreational pilot, and then 
Look yeah. up. So there's some mandatory ones that is a gimme. I mean, those are gimmies. You know he's gonna have to pick them. He doesn't have a choice. Mm -hmm. So those, you just make sure you know those from the top of your from the top of your head. And then the others just cover as much as you can. Yeah. I mean, it's not bad. And FY is the hardest one because it's not aviation related, mm -hmm. and you have to remember stuff. But after you get into aviation stuff, most of it will be in covering since private pilots. Yeah. Now you're just not knowing it. You're explaining it. Yeah. So you just rolled into, you know, you were like, all right, so if you have any questions, let's move into area three and let's talk about airworthiness requirements. And then you, you rolled right in to explain a tomato flames, flaps. And, yeah. Okay. I like and it. Man. I mean, it, it tells you exactly what to explain. What you're doing is you take control. He's not time. asking many questions at all. You're and giving him there. about a two hour a presentation. Yeah, that's it. If he had any questions, he would jump in, ask me a question. I think he asked probably like five questions yeah. in the entire uh, oral. Mm -hmm. So as long as you cover, and like I said, I was looking for the approval. Mm -hmm. I, will, yeah, I, will, I, I read, I will look at him, and I was talking, and he will look down to his book. He will see the keywords that I'm covering, and he was like, yep. And I was like, oh, okay, we're, we're done here. <laughs> yeah. We're done with this. All Move right. on. Sounds good. I think that's about it, man. Is that a wrap? That was it. That was good. There's so much of none about the CFI check, right? And so much fear around it. I and mean, I think today just took the fear right off the top. Yeah. yeah. Now, did he spend a lot of time, or did we already cover this, sign-offs, what you need? He tells you, I just walked into your door and I want to become a pilot. Tell me what to do. Okay. So we had to go over IACRA, ask for the, on the first day, ask for the student pilot certificate, because it takes forever and you need that before they can fly solo. Right. Uh, we, we went over, we covered all that. Everything that a student needs to know before you sign them on solo. So the ground reference maneuvers, go around, so be comfortable talking to ATC. We covered all that. So he was like, I'm a student pilot. Tell me how to become a pilot. And as you were doing, you were looking down and looking up. Most of it is from memory, because okay. I mean, that's the one that I really want you to get to know. It's almost the same. Okay. If you think about it, it's just, you know, discovery flight, TSA, ask for your student pilot certificate, get your medical. So if it's something dumb, you are allowed to go, you know, we don't do much of that. So what we'll do is we'll walk through this together. Oh, when I go did, uh, far a, when, I did uh, when he got me on the, on the add-on, I was like, let me look it up. It's like, Go right ahead. I was like, okay. <laughs> and I spent like 15 minutes looking it up because I couldn't figure it out. And when I got it, he's like, okay, cool. So let's talk about the add on. What did you have to do and where did you find it? So additional aircraft ratings other than ATP is just 6163. And the guy is a commercial multi engine needs a single engine add on. But there's also a list of stuff he's going to do on that check run. And the ACS A 12. Is Addition of airplane single engine ra land rating to an existing commercial pilot certificate. Uh -huh. <coughs> Definitely A. Pilot qualifications. Pilot qualifications? Yeah, that's B. what A is. Or worthiness requirements. There's no C. There's no D. <coughs> yeah, e. but there is no cross country. F. G. H. I J K L. Oh. So this is all what you need if you want a single. If you've got a multi engine commercial. And you want to do your single. And you want to do your single engine add on. You need items <coughs> A B E F G H I J K L. This is an ACS. The 6163 is the sign off. Okay. And then you go to this list and you've got to figure out what these maneuvers are. A it's areas of operation mm -hmm. one through six and then A through. <coughs> Now, here's how I broke it down with Lewis. He said, pre-flight preparation, F and G. So when you go into pre-flight preparation, you only have to cover, which is performance and limitation and operation. Pre-flight procedures, A, B, D, and F. Pre-flight assessment, dash three, airport, seaplane, base, operations. Operation B, traffic patterns, takeoffs, landings, go-arounds, A, B, C, D, E, F, M. This is, a, this is tough. This is why he asked this to you. How did you answer it? No, oh, he didn't want to know all that. He just wanted to know under what uh, regulation it was, so 6163. And then he's like, okay, is there any minimum hours required? I'm like, no, you can do it in one hour if you know what you're doing. Yeah, you just got to okay. cover the all areas of operation and the tasks involved in that. There's six areas, 
and I, I gave them you know A B three, but it, it breaks down like this from this chart. It's right on the ACS. That chart. Yeah, it is. Okay. It shows area of operation one F G and I. So what is F G and I? Where do you break that down? So it's all on the ACS. You just have to go back to the areas of operation and uh, the letters are there. I got you. So that's the ACS. Yeah. But he doesn't care about that. He won't go that deep into it. He just wants to know under what uh, what at far it falls under, which is 61, so what is it, 93, 63? And then uh, whether there is a minimum requirement of hours or not, which there isn't. You so you say, it. you know that, there is no minimum hours requirement. My sign off is going to be under 6163. Yep, B or C. So that way you can say, you know what, I have this and I'll just go through my ACE if it gets deep. The good thing is he wants to be there as much as you do. <laughs> Give him a reason to get out of there quick. Yeah. So okay. I'll, I'll present this question to you and I'll keep doing it. You know, I'll keep saying, what if I was a multi-engine commercial pilot and I needed a single engine add-on? Can you walk me through that? Is that kind of how he brought it to you? And then you're going to say, well, yes. And I would have to look up in that commercial pilot ACS and look up an added rating. So we're going to add a single engine rating and then you can go into your ACS and show them. And it says here, we'll go through this a few times, airplane, single engine land, all of these, all of these. And if he says, if he gets deeper, take me to area one F, G, and H. Well, then you got to go back to the beginning of the ACS, area one, that's A, B, C, F, right there. I got to cover this. Okay. All right. So that's something to work on. Now, don't, don't build it up. I, I'm telling you, it's a lot easier than it sounds. It's okay. real, it really is. Just, just gonna do one thing at a time until I've got it down. Take control of it, that's all. Mm -hmm. that's the, move the shape right along. Don't, okay. let, don't let him, don't wait for him to move it along. You move it yes. along. Yeah. That's why I was like, any questions? No? Yeah, all right, next and session. That's why we did this, because I, I want, it's not about what you know, it's how you approach it. You gotta yeah. attack it. Take it. Mm -hmm. don't, don't let him tell you when to move on, don't let him tell you that. When you start, be like, hey, can you tell me what it is that we're going to cover already? So that way I know it's like... Did I you write it going. down when he told yeah. you what to cover? I, I went through every single one and started circling it. So you just made a little list and you took it up there and you're like, and then, right. and then you end each way, section you know exactly where to go. questions? Okay, moving on to this. That way okay. I didn't have to ask what else you want to cover. No, no, I already knew what we're covering. I'm going straight to the next one. Let's go. Okay. And then you just used your book, your PTS. This is the only thing that I open, and then I used my iPad for the visual stuff that he wanted to see some stuff. He uh, wanted to see the VG diagram. VG diagram? Yeah, uh, with the low factor. He's going to ask you, is this VG diagram a utility category or a normal category? Utility. Don't worry about it. Don't worry why. Just f***ing utility. Because utility gives you more Gs before the aircraft breaks, which is right. why we, when we do a spins, we do in a utility category. Right. So... For some reason, that VG diagram that it's on the lesson, it's a utility category VG okay. diagram. Oh, he also, yes, he also said, uh, let's say I got a P-51 Mustang and I want you to train me on it. What endorsements do you, as a flight instructor, need to be able to train me on a P-51? High altitude endorsement, because that thing can fly up to like 41,000 feet. Uh, oh, you need to have your high performance, because it's obviously more than 200 horsepower, okay. and you need to have your complex. This is retractable gear. So high altitude, high performance, and complex. Are we done? Yeah, yeah that was good. And one turned out really good. All right. Thanks, Alex. Anytime. If you need anything else.